in Psalm 119 this morning, Psalm chapter 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, going to be the longest message. So y'all get ready. Just kidding, just kidding. We're going to get you out of here. But you know, if you pay attention to our culture today, you know that there's a movement going on, and this is not necessarily a good movement. This is a movement amongst our younger generation, and it's called Christian deconstructionism. Christian deconstructionism is this idea philosophically that dismantles contradictory beliefs in the faith of one's upbringing to try to strip away to what is actually real. And many of our young people are going through this deconstruction. In fact, Christian researcher Kerry Newhoff says that only one in ten people who grow up in the church are actually now going to church. One in ten people. This is unprecedented. We already know that two-thirds of graduating seniors do not go back to church after college. This new group of de-churched and irreligious generation, they, they actually have coined a term for themselves. And you can, you know, you can go and read blogs and, and hear stories, testimonials. They term themselves as ex-evangelicals. Have you heard this, this term, <laughs> ex-evangelicals? And they, they all share this resentful mentality of organized religion. They are embittered. They are angry, and they call themselves ex-evangelicals. I can even remember over 17 years ago at Ole Miss, I took a course on early Christianity. And I can remember my professor, uh, he, he was brilliant. I, I mean, he knew Latin and Greek and Aramaic. He knew almost a dozen languages. He never used notes, and he'd write them on the... I, I didn't know how to study. I just, you know, just prayed and, and read these books. But I can remember he said, you Christians, you believe the Bible's true, yet there's over 300,000 mistakes in the Bible. I didn't know what to do. I, I was like this youth pastor, and, you know, I, I didn't know what, what to do. But at the time, I remember, well, I was talking to our students about defending their faith. And I ran across a book called uh, Evidence that demands a verdict. This is the actual book that I bought when I was youth pastor here. Uh, it has survived. It was one of only 12 books that survived Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. So uh, don't smell this book. It is a pretty rank smelling book. But it's, it's, it's an incredible resource because it shows you all the historical data that we have that supports the reliability of the New Testament. It talks about all the early, uh, you know, books of the Bible that we have, you know, a, a chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 from 20 to 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And, and I can remember my, my logic teacher at Ole Miss talking about the impossibility of miracles. Somebody said, y'all, that's why you probably should have gone to Mississippi State. You should have to deal with all that, right? Well, it, it was interesting because... It, 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 was the, it, it was the skeptics that really caused me to step back and say, all right, it, is, this, is this real? Is this really real? And that's when I said, you know what? I'm going to take a step back. And I'm going to strip away all of my notions, my worldview, my, my, you know, my influences, my family. And here's what I'm going to do. I, I just want to lay my faith on what I believe is true, and that's the Scriptures. I really meant it, church. I, I mean, this, I, I went through this cultural deconstruction. I said, I, I know this is true. Now, the way I grew up, I don't know if it's true or not. I want to I weigh everything that I experienced in church with what this Bible said. And I said, if it leads me to be a Methodist, I'll be a Methodist. I really did. If it leads me to be Presbyterian, I'll be Presbyterian. If it leads me to be Episcopal or Catholic or Orthodox, whatever the destination, 
I'm willing to go. And so I started reading Scripture. And uh, I'm still Baptist. Hey, hey. <laughs> my, my, my parents are happy, right? Um, but, but one of the reasons is because of the importance of what we believe about God's Word. And that's what we've been talking about this entire collection. We, we've been looking at, at this collection of messages just called the, the Bible Collection, more than a book. This is more than a book. In fact, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just say this, that the Bible is the most popular book in history. In fact, it's not even a book, if you think about it. It's 66 books. This is a library of information. The, the most widely published book in the history of the world. Multiple times over. And the interesting thing is that God used fallible people to write his word. I mean, he used, you know, shepherds and farmers. He used peasants, musicians, poets. He even used tax collectors and politicians. I mean, he used all these people to communicate his word. Moses in the wilderness, Jeremiah in a dungeon, Paul in a prison, John on the island of Patmos. I mean, God used all these people on three different continents in the world over the span of 1,500 years. That is amazing. We said last week, that there's more evidence to believe the truth in God's word, historical evidence, than, listen, all of Greco-Roman history combined. Over 5,800 ancient manuscripts that support the facts and the archaeological realities that we see in God's Word. I love what Dr. Daniel Wallace says of that Dallas Theological Seminary. He's a textual critic, which means he wants to get back to the original text. He says, it is an embarrassing deluge of evidence compared to any other historical document. That's why I've entitled today's message, From Deconstruction to Reconstruction. From Deconstruction to Reconstruction. In Psalm 119, this is what we're going to find out. We're going to find... Three foolproof experiential reasons to trust God's Word. Three foolproof experiential reasons to trust God's Word. Psalm 119 is the best chapter in Scripture about Scripture. It has 176 verses in this chapter. And 171 of those verses are about God's Word, Scripture, laws, His precepts, His teachings. And so the first foolproof experiential reason to trust God's Word is number one. Number one, the Word of God purifies us. The Word of God purifies us. And let me tell you, if you're in God's Word and you really believe God's Word, you know this is true. Because something happened in your soul that has transformed the core of your being because of his word. The word purifies us. Look, look at Psalm 119. Look at Psalm 119. Verse 9 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? <laughs> By living according to your word. By living according to to your word. Now, church, I think it's pretty safe to say that we are living in a day and age where it is almost impossible for our young people to remain pure. I mean, we are inundated constantly, barraged by all of these marketing specialists that are leading us away from God's precepts. I mean, it's hard to scroll Facebook. It, it's hard to watch commercials in the morning news. That's why I just go ahead, I, I, I do online streaming, and I just like pay so the commercials don't run. I, 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 I mean, I, I feel like I have to cover my eyes just to watch commercials because our culture is always going to lead away from what Christ 
is calling us to. And so we, as parents, we as pastors, we as adults, we want to protect the next generation. We want to preserve the foundation of their faith. When the world is emphasized over the word, our faith, listen, will always wander away. We know this. Our faith will always wander when we're attracted to the world over the word. When, when sports and hobbies are more important than the church, then what else would you expect from a younger generation who looks to older generations who don't place a priority of God's word or the primacy to the church? What else would you expect? This is why I was so encouraged last week. You know, God is so faithful in answering prayer. And uh, if you were here last week, you saw that um, Justin Gordon was baptized. And the, the significance of that, to me, was so important because Justin, he was just a reflection of what was going on behind the scenes. And, and, and maybe what Justin doesn't know is that there was more going on behind the scenes that he even knew about that we as a staff and as a pastor we were already praying for Justin's salvation because we knew that his parents and his family were already praying for his salvation we know that even Ashley who led him to Jesus was praying for his salvation we know that uh, we we know that you know Bailey and we know that Valicia they they knew they wanted Justin to be in church, to be in a position and in a posture of receiving Christ and salvation. Do you see it? And so, it, it, you know, th this is what God has created from the beginning of time. He created the family unit to come alongside each other and nurture the faith of our children. This is holiness. Look at what verse, uh, verse 10 says. I seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that what? That I may not sin against you. You know what the, the Psalter is saying? He's saying, listen, God's word is the one and only standard of purity. Nothing more. Nothing less. God's word is not just the standard for purity. It's the reason we should be pure. It, it's, it, it shares the difficulties of purity, but not, not just that. It, it shows us the blessings of purity and the possibility of purity. So number one, the word of God purifies us. That's number one. Number two, the word of God prepares us. The word of God prepares us. Look at verse 12. Praise be to you. Let me teach your decrees. So all of a sudden, uh, the, the Psalter, the psalmist, takes a praise break. He just says, just let me pause and get excited about God's word. Because God's word has done something in the core of my being. I just got to jump. I just got to clap. I got to get excited about what God is doing in my life. In other words, listen. You cannot have the worship of God without the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is the manual for the worship of God. Or else it's not real See, that's, that's, we're wired for that. We're, we're wired for worship. That's, that's who we are fundamentally. But the problem is we, we, get our worship, we get our worship confused with things that aren't worthy to be worshipped. And, and I'll just give you an example. And I'm just going to be totally transparent. So, you know, me and Jimmy Gage, we're in Honduras, and man, we're, God's doing some amazing things and salvation, and you know, it's just incredible trip, and 
in the back of my mind, you know what the enemy's saying? You did, you're not even getting to watch the World Series. I mean, Ole Miss will probably never go to the World Series again, and you're in, you're in a foreign country. You can't even watch it. And so uh, I knew that, that my plane on the way back, I knew that I could watch live TV on the plane. And, uh, and so I pull up live TV, and it's, you know, apparently we're the, the Caribbean, it's closed. You can't watch ESPN. Um, and we're flying, I'm flying somewhere over Cuba, and this is the Oklahoma game, the first game, and all of a sudden, uh, it, you know, it's showing, and there's a home run, and I jump up, and, you know, in the middle of a plane, I was like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> you know, why is he excited? Nobody else on the plane is watching the game. And another home run, another home run. We win the game. I'm elated. I'm excited. I can't wait to be back home and watch uh, the next game, game two, with my family. I don't make it home. I have to spend... You know, 30 hours in Houston, I'm at the airport, you know, I make lemonade out of lemon, I go to Papacitos, eat my favorite Tex-Mex, and I'm back at the airport, and I, and I convince this guy who's working this little bar in the middle of the airport to turn on the game. So I'm sitting there watching and uh, eating my Papacitos, and all of a sudden, you know, this guy shows up in an old Miss shirt. So, hey, you know, <laughs> hey, okay. He's from Jackson. I don't know his name, still don't know his name. This other little girl, she's flying to Meridian. Um, we're watching the game. We are so excited at the end of the game. We start hugging each other, and we're late at high five, and it's the most amazing experience of my life. And, you know, I, I thought after that, why do I get so excited about a game, but sometimes I'm not that excited about my faith, you know? Do I ever just take a moment? And take a praise break for all the faithfulness that God represents in my life. Sometimes we, we treat God's worship more like a funeral than a celebration. If God really has saved us eternally, how should we respond to being saved eternally? So, the Word of God is the manual for the worship of God. And this requires, listen, humility and repentance. One of two things will happen. The Bible will either keep you from sin, or listen, sin will keep you from the Bible. Right? It, the reason that many of us don't open God's Word is because we know deep down <laughs> it's going to convict us of a sin issue that we have. And that's why the, the Psalter, he says, listen, verse 13, with my lips I recount all the laws that come from where? From your mouth. That is, the, the word of God is saturating the mouth of the Psalter. So God's word prepares us for life. That's number two. Lastly, the Word of God pleases us. The Word of God pleases us. Now, I, there's two different ways to read this point. When you read, when you read it initially, it's typically the wrong way to read the point. So I want you to be real careful how you read point three. The Word of God, listen, the Word of God does not conform to our sinful pleasures. No matter how it makes us feel, or how much God's word offends us. It, do, it never conforms to our feelings. We conform to the satisfaction, the joy, as Connor put it, the joy of God's word. It's our ultimate best interest. Look at what he says in verse 14. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I mean, the, the transliteration for this Hebrew uh, word here is jumping around for joy. That is that we have something to jump around for joy for in light of what Christ has done for us. And so verse 15 says, I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not, what, neglect your word. So the question is this, does God's word please you? 
Or are you deceived in believing that your sin is pleasing you more than your God? And that's at the very heart of what sin actually is. I, I love the words of St. Augustine of Hippo. He said, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. There's a lot of people who are praying that prayer. Make me pure, but not yet. That's what we tell our young people. Oh, it's okay, just go, go live your life and maybe you'll come back around. The problem is, they're not coming back around because they're deceived into believing that their sin is more satisfying than their Savior. You see it? I, I love what uh, Philip Henry did with his children back in the 18th century. He, he told his two boys to read one verse a night on Psalm 119. One verse a night. And by the end of that year, both of his children would have read Psalm 19 twice. They read one verse a night. Because he knew if they would read Psalm 119, they would grow to love the Word of God. So Philip Henry did this, and many of us are influenced by this family, whether or not we realize it or not. Because his son Matthew Henry loved the Bible so much that he wrote thousands of words in commentary about the scriptures. Much is used today because of God's word. So this, le this leads to a, a bigger question that we'll come back around to next week. But how do we know that the right 66 books are in the Bible? How do we know that the right ones made it? You watch the History Channel, you watch Discovery Channel around Easter and around Christmas, and they will confuse you. How do we know? Let's rewind. 1,500 years. You've got God dictating the Ten Commandments on stone in Hebrew on Mount Sinai. That's where it all starts. All right? God gave these commandments to Moses. Moses wrote the Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Pentateuch was recorded on all of these, these sheepskin scrolls, some of which were over 150 feet. So by the year 500 B.C., the 39 books of the canonized Old Testament were completed. By the year 500 B.C. Now, Fast forward to the first century, the New Testament. It was completed on papyrus. This is a flattened reed plant. The year 367, uh, Athanasius, he's a bishop in Alexandria. He listed all of the books of the Bible that we currently have in the New Testament. It was later approved by an African senate of Hippo in 393 A.D. And these books were chosen universally by the early church and by the early church fathers. In fact, this is what Athanasius of Alexandria said about the canonized scripture. He said, these are the fountains of salvation in them. That's the canon of scripture. That whoever thirsts may be satisfied by the eloquence which is in them. In them alone is set forth the doctrine of piety. Let no one add to them or take anything away. So now we, we turn on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel. We see uh, you know, professors like Bart Ehrman from Yale and, and all these, you know, these seminary professors talking about the textual variances. And then you have the Lost Gospels, the, gospel, uh, the Gnostic Gospels, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene found in Nag Hammadi, but the problem is that these Gospels do not measure up to the Gospels that we have. Thomas was not written by Thomas, not written by Mary Magdalene. So how do we know what the canonized Scripture are? There are four measurements. Number one, it has to be apostolic. That is that it has to be written by an apostle 
or someone under the direction of an apostle. That's number one. Number two, it's got to be authentic. It has to be historically authentic, written by an authoritative voice of the prophets. The book of James was written by James. You know, the book of John, written by John and Peter and so forth and so on. has to be authentic. Number three, has to be ancient. It has to go back to the actual events they are referring to. We talked about this last week. We've got manuscripts between 30, uh, 20 and 30 years after the resurrected Jesus. This is why we reject the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospels that you hear about on TV. And then number four, it's got to be accurate. These scriptures have to agree with the orthodox teachings of the early church. They, that, that were already in circulation uh, amongst the a- ancient Near East. And, and these are the doctrinal liturgies from teachings, the miracles, and the resurrection of Jesus. They are all accurate in the accounts that we have. And so I believe that God has unequivocally and unquestionably preserved his word for our worship, and I've only touched the surface of the reliability of our faith. So what does all this mean? It means that, you know what? It's okay to challenge the faith. God is big enough to handle it. God has more evidence that will demand it. And you will find that Christianity is historically reliable. Take out your postmodern worldview. Take out your academic worldview. Take out your familial persuasion. Take out whatever you want. But when you leave the word of God, (laughs) deconstruction, will lead to a rediscovery of faith. Will you take out the word of God and you destruct your your faith? Deconstruction will lead to deconversion without the word of God. Why? The word of God purifies us. The word of God prepares us. And the word of God pleases us as the only truth and only joy this side of heaven. Can you pray with me?